Hello, kiddies. Hello. Let's have a look and see what our friend Rumpty the guinea pig's up to today. <laughs> ah, there he is. Hello, Rumpty. I wonder what Rumpty's going to do next. <laughs> I know what he's doing. Rumpty's thinking. <laughs> He's thinking about. I think he's thinking about what he's going to have for tea today. He's just found a piece of carrot. I think he's looking for another piece. The IBA wished to warn all viewers that the so called comic gag that is about to follow is in no way nice or suitable for young children and persons of a Queen's Park Rangers disposition. <laughs> I think Rumpty's trying to find where we all are so that he can come and say hello. <laughs> if we call him, he'll know that we're over here. Let's all say... seem to have lost the unexpected nasty bit for the moment, I'm afraid. But never mind, it was far too nasty to show you anyway. So, instead, here's something not quite so nasty, an old 1950s thriller series. <laughs> Good evening. The story I have to tell you tonight is set in a heavily decaying, decrepit old television series like this one. Imagine, if you can, the magic movie world of Hollywood in the grip of a powerful fog more dense than living man has yet witnessed as a gruff old clock chimes midnight. A lone and solitary figure is seen scurrying through the deserted streets to keep an awesome appointment with destiny. Remember to sing the proper words for verse three, boy. You're not in the showers now, you know. Sorry, sir. Right, well, you'd better get dressed. Stop doing that with the soap. <laughs> now, Tableau's pretty shoddy. Frimpson, put those crisps away. You're supposed to be a virgin. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's called acting. Now, then, who was on the strings for the angels? Me, sir. Yes, well, we better get some of it stronger next time, don't you? All right, stop everything! <coughs> All boys will line up against that wall in twos and crouch down with their hands on their bottoms until I find out who is responsible. Sorry, headmaster. Come on!
Right, <laughs> I'm putting the entire school in detention in the boiler room until somebody tells me what has happened. And I'll find out one way or another. Hmm? Hmm? Very well. You leave me no alternative. As of now, the tuck shop is closed. We don't have a tuck shop, Headmaster. What? There is no tuck shop. All right, who's stolen the tuck shop? Come on, <laughs> Headmaster. <laughs> Very well. All boys will report to my study to have their fingers removed. There never was a tuck shop, Headmaster. I see. Well, let that be a lesson to you all. <laughs> right, carry on with the rehearsal, Adams. The concert continues with the head of games, assisted by three boys, in a display of precision flogging. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I know. Why don't we have you flogging the boys? All right. I've remembered now. I've remembered now. Some boy has stolen the football pitch. Uh, I want every single one of you to form a regular quadrilateral until the culprit comes forward. I will not have pilfering on my farm. Head, <laughs> headmaster, the football pitch is outside. Where? There, stretched out between the goalposts. Yeah, I thought it was kept rolled up in the pavilion. No. Oh, yeah. Nurse is always left outside. Well, it doesn't look very safe to me. I mean, supposing it were to fall down and hit somebody on the head, I think we'd better have it nailed to the sky, just to be sure. Hmm? All right, carry on, Miss Persky. <laughs> right, we'll uh, skip the flogging, Mr Dessard. Adams? And now the New Boys Dramatic Society will present their version of the chariot race sequence from Ben Hur. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. I don't feel very well. Have you got a note? No, sir. Then get back in there! like this, you will look back on these school days as the happiest days of the rest of your life. <laughs> there you are. What did I tell you? <laughs> Yet all was not as it seemed. For Claude was above all a man of ambition. And to live in the shadow of Bergenstein and lose Beth to the Italian bassoon player from Cincinnati <laughs> bred in him the cruelest envy. Meanwhile, Schreiber and his accomplice had worked out the tattoo on the sailor's left thigh and were at this very moment going backstage to plant the dynamite when events suddenly took an unexpected turn. In a seemingly limitless profusion of color and pattern, the myriad forms of the animal kingdom are testament to a range of scientific marvels no creation of man can ever rival. Marvels known only to the wonderful world of nature. Its average weight of 250,000 pounds makes the Sumatran bull rhino among the heaviest of land mammals. Despite this, it is the animal world's most consummate master of camouflage. It is almost impossible to believe that in this picture there are 108 adult rhinoceroses. So skillfully that they blend in with their surroundings, you would hardly notice them at all were they not pointed out to you. Rhinoceroses spend two months of each year in rut, 
the males in March and the females in October. This makes life difficult, and also a few other things. Yes, life for Mom and Papa Rhino is not always happily wedded bliss. Here, we see a male rhinoceros worrying over a sexual neurosis. He's just discovered that during lovemaking, his wife has been going out with another rhino. As a result, he is now on six Valium a day and considering going to an analyst. Rhinos in the wild share a somewhat restricted diet, feeding mainly on lasagna, ratatouille, and most pasta dishes except vermicelli. In their spare time, they like to relax by playing squash, disco dancing, and horse riding. Their ambition is to go round the world, meet Sasha Distel, and eventually open their own beauty salon. This 18-year-old rhino is shortly to give birth to his young. It is almost impossible to believe that when he does so, his rhino spawn will contain some 40,000 eggs, each of which will hatch out into a fully grown adult rhinoceros. Yet every second our pregnant odd-toed ungulate must beware, for out there lies its single most deadly enemy, the termite. Yes, it is almost impossible to believe that this small yet tiny termite can swallow a rhinoceros up to four times its own size. Even more incredible, just six of these minute compass termites could, between them, carry the House of Commons to the top of Mount Everest. Well, many people are asking why they don't. Yet here, in this termite hill, brawn is more than matched by brain. It is a system based on mutual reliance, on total equality, on industrial collectivism. In short, a socialist commie state that must be smashed to protect the security of the Western Alliance. Yeah, these lousy, stinking red termites will, if allowed to continue their insidious leftist policies, pose a threat to freedom, liberty, and the American way of life. But fear not, patriots. Uncle Sam has it all under control. And if they the highest subtlety, men from the CIA have already infiltrated their ranks. Yeah, the poisoned, boot-polished boys are once again in command of the situation. With legendary stealth, our heroes operate unseen within the very community, finding their time until eventually these dirty agitators won't know what hit them! <coughs> yeah, the West breathes again as yet another Marxist incursion is crushed and a blow struck for democracy! <laughs> that taught you a lesson, you slant-eyed pig! <laughs> Yes, the wonderful world of nature is a world whose splendor and beauty we too can share if only we can learn to live with our fellow creatures in peace and harmony. Good evening. The pieces of the jigsaw then were slowly beginning to fit together. The naked blonde in the bedroom had clearly been lying when she claimed to be Frank Sinatra. Or <laughs> when she claimed to be Bamba Gascon. <laughs> Yet there was one thing the commissioner still did not do. <laughs> Why did the camera keep coming back to me in this airy little room for no apparent reason? What possible link could there be between me telling you all this and the next scene? find out. He paid a visit on a two-bit actress named Jane Russell <laughs> Bel Air Home in Hollywood. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to the Albert Hall for this, the finals of Miss World 1980. Well, unfortunately, Sasha Distel can't be with us this year, I'm afraid. <laughs> He, uh, he opened his mouth early this evening and his personality escaped. But we do have, we do have a very special treat for you. Miss Esther Ranson. Yes, tonight you'll be able to, as she's still in her dressing room getting pregnant for the show. <laughs> well, in just a few platitudes from now, we'll see all 75 sets of teeth in their swimsuits, and then afterwards we'll probably see sense. But first, let's meet tonight's judges, who are a right-looking ponce no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Last year's winner, Hilary Pritchard from Futtock's End. <laughs> and finally, the reigning Eric Morley, a jar of Brill Cream with the lid off. <laughs> and on now to the girls, and our first lovely contestant is number one, Miss Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Lonely 
is Carleen Marashad. I am 19 years old. I am a fashion consultant. I am a stuffed dummy. Number two, Miss Adriatic. My name is Marita Tovunque. I am 21 years old. I am reading this off a card. I am made completely from straw. And number three, Miss Africa South. Just as Leroy Williamson, I uh, is completely black, and one my heart I think it's square one. Yes, sir, it am now looking at the beauty contest where we dance from. Our lordy lordy, my sir. Number four, Miss Action Industrial. My name is Les Perskins. I'm a shop steward at the ABS. I'm 43 years old. I'm blacking out the next 50 minutes of this show because I want more Mazuma. <laughs> and thank you very much there, Sasha. Well, now we've whittled the girls down from 963 to naught, and we're going to start again. <laughs> so let's have the first one right along here. Miss Spain. <laughs> Miss Spain is a 20-year-old Dago who works as a photographic model on the outskirts of clothing. Her vital statistics are one hour and 37 minutes, and her hobbies include pumping blood around her body and blowing her nose on photos of John Stapleton. Tell me, Miss Dago, what will you do with the money if you win? Well, I'm hoping to use it to advance my research into interrelationships in marine co-systems. <laughs> well, when it comes to interesting biological figures, I'm sure you'll have no problem there. Thank you very much, Miss Spain. <laughs> and now, Miss Jack Benny. <laughs> now, Miss Jack Benny, you were born in Waukegan near Chicago, and your hobbies are playing the violin, bossing a black butler named Rochester around, and being extremely mean. <laughs> 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 Fine, well, thank you very much, Miss Jack Benny. <laughs> and finally, Miss United States of America. <laughs> USA is a professional cheerleader at insurance salesman's funerals, and she enjoys reading brown books, polishing her teeth with Duraglit, and disco dancing with other rhinoceroses. Now tell me, Miss USA, how do you find England? Uh, sorry, I don't speak English. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> how do you find England? Oh, simple. You just follow the boats from Pakistan. <laughs> I just love the English because they're so clever. Have you seen their latest invention? Braille beer mats for the blind drunk. But seriously. Fine. And now, I understand your parents were divorced when you were young. Well, that's right. My father wanted to buy a water bed, but my mother said it was bad enough sleeping with one wet blanket. That is, I had a very unhappy childhood. As a baby, I had to push my own pram. My family was so prudish, my teddy bear and I had to sleep in separate beds. Matter of fact, we were so... Fine. And now I understand you're married to one of Bob Hope's gag writers? Well, I wouldn't say I was married to one of Bob Hope's gag writers, but when we go to bed together, a man has to stand by the pillow and hold up idiot boards. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's one idiot you haven't bored. <laughs> Thank you very much there, Miss USA. Well, I wouldn't say I was Miss USA. But... Will you get off. So, uh, there we are. And uh, as Ray Morley prepares now to announce the winner, let's take a little look backstage, where we can see that the, uh, the tension really is mounting now, which just goes to prove that the girls are human after all. And the runner-up, number 13, Miss USA! <laughs> And
and the winner is, and I must say it's a most surprising choice indeed, this Miss World 1980 is none other than... That was the last in the present series of Not the Nine O'Clock News. And now it's time for more American detective action. this very hotel, dark one. Right, blonde one. <laughs> There's not a moment to lose. You could strike again at any moment. <laughs> yeah, we can't let that happen under any circumstances. <laughs> Okay, Nancy boys, this is the end of the line for you. Sorry, they're not quite handsome enough for this episode yet. Won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is certainly one of the most urgent cases we've ever been involved with, Dark One. We've no time to think of ourselves. This city needs our help now. You said it, blonde one. We mustn't waste another minute. Right, Nancy boy, start saying your prayers. I've got to... Just two more minutes, okay? So sorry to keep you. Have a nice day. <laughs> right. We owe it to society to make this country of ours a good and better place to live in. <laughs> a place where folk are free. Free looking like bronzed, artificial lumps of plastic. A place where man shall not be discriminated against for the punce-like quality of his open neck shirts. A place where precocious American youths are free to mouth banalities like this all day long without fear of mature television. <laughs> now, for some action. I just remembered. What? My nail varnish. It was still wet. Oh, no. Good evening. I hope that you have enjoyed my little story for tonight. I'm sorry that it didn't have a happier ending. But then again, you can't always have everything.
just a reminder that a 45 RPM record is now available in the shops of me reading this announcement. 